So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's uh, good to have you back for uh, day two of the boot camp. Um, we had a quite full day yesterday uh, in terms of uh, coverage of a lot of basic concepts and a lot of basic tasks uh, within model building. Um, uh, so, um, we often begin these boot camp days with retrospectives, and um, those retrospectives often serve as a jumping up po off point for questions and discussion. And um, I'd like to continue that tradition during this boot camp with a special emphasis on the uh, engagement, the the discussion and question side. Um, but not least because we're joined uh, by. Uh, New faces. Uh, I did want to talk some about uh, the broad swath of material that we covered yesterday. Uh, so yesterday um, saw us um, launching off the boot camp beyond sort of administrivia with uh, discussion of system science and, and particularly the motivations for system science and the uh, gnarly nature of, of complex systems. The, the, the ubiquity of these systems um, in the health sphere, uh, where we have uh, a uh, wide array of uh, uh, some of the most challenging health problems that we face uh, in our society um, and in the world. Uh, that are not merely complex in a vernacular sense, but in fact complex in a in a technical sense, meaning uh, they exhibit the set of properties such that the behavior of the whole is cannot be reduced to to its mere parts. Um, and uh, within this context, uh, we see the behaviors of these systems. Uh, often present surprises. Uh, they often present challenges for effective management or, or intervention and challenges for explaining behavior. Uh, commonly, these systems uh, further go on to, to constitute what are known as wicked problems, or at least in some of the most prominent cases. Um, involving matters like uh, disinformation and misinformation and spread in our society, matters like involving uh, climate change and, and responses to climate change, um, issues having to do with uh, uh, ecological challenges uh, and its entanglement with human health as sometimes um, embodied in, in broader One Health efforts. Um, in these in these in these types of contexts, we have complex systems issues combined with issues that verge on or that require discussion of values in our society, what it means to have a just or a, uh, uh, a uh, an equitable society. But um, regardless of of uh, those uh, more um, uh, wicked problems, Complex systems in general, whether they're in the large or in the small, uh, present us with quandaries for effectively managing them. Our intuitions, our seat-of-the-pants judgments about how to interact with these systems are, are often far off from what's actually needed to effectively um, uh, grope with them or, or grapple with them, to effectively um, achieve our goals with them. I argue that even in daily life, when it comes to relationship dynamics, when it comes to things like traffic jams, uh, when it comes to bottlenecks in the healthcare systems, when we need care, these are, are familiar, um, uh, familiar phenomena, but ones that are indicative of kind of systemic dysfunction. Now, what, what singles these systems out um, is the ways in which uh, they can't be reduced to their pieces, that it's the interconnections between the pieces, um, even more so than the pieces themselves, the structure of the system is captured by those interconnections um, that dictates uh, the behavior of the system and how it responds 
to attempts to intervene in it. Um, and uh, whether it's antibiotics or cases involving emergency weights and, and patient flow on a system-wide basis, whether it's matters having to do with uh, the opioid epidemic or uh, the spread of, um, of sexually transmitted infections, or indeed syndemics of chronic diseases and communicable diseases and social issues. Um, we have this common thread that we're dealing with a whole greater than some of the parts. And because we are wetware, um, as formally demonstrated in, in controlled experiments, really doesn't give us, doesn't equip us with the requisite skills to interact with these systems effectively. Um, we need to turn to other tools that assist us in that process. You know, the research has conclusively demonstrated that even a very sophisticated mathematical understanding at a conceptual level just does not equip one to effectively control these systems. But something that can, something that can be helpful in, in growing our intuitions, helpful in improving our mental models, helpful in improving our judgments, or at least making us less prone to misjudgment, is uh, working with mimicked versions of these systems. Mimics in the form of computational, uh, simplified representations of them. Uh, and uh, it is for that purpose that in, in uh, system science, we turn to simulation models. Now, I argued yesterday that these models deliver a great deal of value for the interdisciplinary teams who work with them for a variety of reasons. Some of those reasons uh, are that the models themselves can bring people together to pull knowledge, to share understanding, to share their knowledge of their area of the system in terms of expertise or their area of lived experience. They can bring new perspectives and allow for formal sharing of those perspectives. Um, and they can discover, and they often, the, the modeling process often discovers, it uncovers differences and definitions on how terms are used uh, among different practitioners. It can bring out um, it can spread awareness of what is known and what is not known in certain areas of the system, change and update people's understanding, improve people's understanding of um, what data is available and the limitations on that data. Just by making a model explicit um, to depict its structure, and we, we saw quite a few of these yesterday, even though we're just getting started, um, elements of model structure, like these uh, these sort of uh, elements of structure. I'm gonna share my screen so those remote can see this uh, and just remind them as well. But we, we saw elements of model structure in models like this, where we depicted stages of smoking and, and development of heart disease. Uh, but we also uh, saw it in the co context of neighborhood mobility, one of, one of these other models we worked with where we had structure captured regarding changes in location and, and uh, the spread of infection. Uh, and those elements of structure capture assumptions capture understanding of parties within the modeling team uh, that, that are commonly captured in people's heads and their mental model. By putting it into uh, an explicit form and making it something that's shared between parties, it invites critique, it invites challenge, it invites um, different perspectives being brought up. And by putting my understanding of the you know, stages of an infection, I can invite critique, for example, about 
you know, the need to represent a latent state of infection or capture the fact that many people who get infected are carriers, but not capable, not themselves developing pathology in, in, in a way that brings forward symptoms on their part or that impairs their health. It may reveal that many are, are asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic. Um, so having a model structure that's explicit, that's transparent, takes understanding out of our heads and puts it in a form that uh, that leads us, um, that, that represents a certain um, willingness to be vulnerable, but, but lets us welcome critique in that understanding and more quickly move towards improving our knowledge or at least pooling our knowledge bringing to bear different knowledge sets to improve the representation. So that's part of what modeling achieves, bringing people together, pooling knowledge, pooling uh, understanding, um, uh, con making consistent um, the names and the, the descriptions of things, but also taking understanding of structure out of our heads and putting it into a form that uh, can be collectively critiqued and challenged and improved. And modeling forms a great service in this area. And one of the things that Jen has taught shortly will be discussing is uh, the role that, that uh, even fairly simple representations like causal loop diagrams can serve in bringing people together uh, and eliciting different perspectives on a situation. In this regard, it bears noting something that eluded me for many years. I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate it, but it was actually documented uh, in the social science literature uh, quite far back. Um, and that is the fact that it's easy um, for many to think that a model structure like this as depicted um, has barriers associated with it, with people from different backgrounds, people not trained in model, in modeling. And uh, that you have to overcome those barriers to, uh, to have them equipped to critique a model. And that's true. But a model like this, a structure like this, a depiction like this, or with causal loop diagrams or system structure diagrams or, or variant, agent-based variants thereof, these can serve as what social scientists sometimes call boundary objects. They serve as objects when you bring together people from very different disciplinary backgrounds, often with different jargon, different languages, uh, different ways of describing things, very different levels of education, et cetera. And they're confronted with a common depiction of a situation. So it's it's seen by all of them, and they gather around it. Often that shared depiction, that that depiction they all see, can actually facilitate communication between them because they can point at it. They can they can direct their comments to particular areas with some confidence that even if their language is somewhat different, another party will know what, where in the process they're describing um, you know, their concerns. Um, so a diagram, whether it's articulated causal diagram language, stock and flow language, state charts, um, some of the Asian based variants we have uh, created, uh, can actually facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration when used well. It can facilitate um, parties from very different backgrounds communicate. And models uh, within the modeling process deliver a lot of value from us. Um, by taking understanding, taking assumptions, taking beliefs out of our heads, putting it out there in the clear light of day, um, being willing to be vulnerable so that we can jointly advance, pull our knowledge and advance our understanding. But simulation, as we saw, went beyond that. It serves that purpose, 
But with a simulation model, we have something more. We have a specification of our assumptions about this system that is precise enough that it can be enacted, that it can be, that we can look at its logical consequences dynamically, that is over time. And we saw that yesterday with uh, several models, like with this neighborhood model, we saw that we could take our assumptions as captured in this model, capturing this model of people's behavior, and we could run them forward over time and see their logical consequences in terms of uh, quantities as diverse as uh, the prevalence of infection or the number of cumulative cases of infection or the count of times that people were infected or or the uh, the places where they were infected, et cetera. Um, so we saw that by enacting a model, we could see the behavior that's implied by that model structure. And I, I used a term, which I'm going to return to later this morning, uh, after Jenna's talk, which is this, this phrase, this slogan, um, most commonly used widely in, in system dynamics, structure determines behavior. And I argued that while the details of the parameter assumptions had an impact here, uh, yes. We're not looking at the uh, running model, we're oh. looking at your uh, any logic page. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Thank you. you. Shared only the window, not the I guess window. so. Yeah, that's, um, I, I tried to never do that. That's interesting. Uh, okay, so thank you. Here we go. Um, so you see, this is the sort of logical consequence of this, uh, together with, you know, some additional details involving, um, the structure of the environment in which people are circulating and involving the specific parameter values. But I argued yesterday that from a dynamic modeling perspective, the structure, this this underlying, um, uh, this underlying picture of the logical flow, the rules by which agents can evolve, for example, in terms here of their infection status or their location over there, or for this other model that we built up together, their smoking status, their heart disease status, and the interplay between them. It's that structure at a deeper level, rather than just the vagaries of the parameter values that more foundationally shape the behavior. Parameter values matter. They allow changes within certain ranges of behavior allowed by the structure. But it's really the structure that determines what modes of behavior are possible. Do you, can you have an endemic equilibrium where it sort of oscillates around a certain level? Or is that not simply not possible for any parameter value? Can you have a stable disease-free equilibrium? Um, uh, can you have multiple equilibria? Can you have different situations to which uh, this system goes? These are the types of factors that can be that can be uh, that can be dictated more foundationally by the structure. Um, the presence of feedbacks of certain sorts, uh, of delays, make possible certain behavior, oscillations ex uh, versus exponential growth, et cetera. The parameter values tweak that, but it's the structure that often dictates more foundational. Now, this has a lot of consequences. We're going to come back to them um, after Jenna's talk, but it's one of the reasons why, in Jenna's talk, we're interested in capturing the understanding of the stakeholders about structure. But I emphasized something else yesterday as well about, about these models. Because by enacting um, the logical implications of a scenario based on a certain structure uh, and seeing, seeing the results that come from this, we open up a new route for leveraging the often facet knowledge of stakeholders by showing the logical consequences over time of 
our assumptions as captured in the model, particularly in structure, but also some in parameters, we, we take a stance and say, we expect this behavior to result. And that behavior may or may not comport with, it may or not be consistent with, and may, not, may or may not be um, jive with what we observe from the world. And when it doesn't jive with what we observe from the world, when it runs um, uh, contrary to uh, the experience of ourselves or others with lived experience or people who are system stakeholders in the system, that's an opportunity to learn. That tells us something about our model, that our model is um, not positing a situation that is consistent with these aspects of experience. Often it brings out critique that's more subtle than that. It'll bring out critique that, well, it's like what I see in this regard, but not in that regard. Um, and these are not critiques about the model that would have come about without output. It takes the model producing dynamics over time to elicit often that understanding from stakeholders bring out those critiques and, and to inform our understanding so that we can go back and refine our model structure. So it's the fact that we have a simulation model, not merely a, a depiction of a situation that further allows us to leverage the shared understanding, knowledge, experience, and lived experience, uh, particularly uh, of, of people within a modeling project or those consulting. Um, so, we're, we're in this boot camp making use not just of modeling, but of simulation modeling. And a key part of it will be using the output from models to, to, gather, to gather knowledge and to improve the model. And I argued yesterday, most vociferously from this podium, that modeling is best thought of not as a laborious process to, and, and fragile process to create a crystal ball. Not as a process that, you know, produces something that will tell us the answer. Not as a process that mimics the world um, in all its details, but instead as a learning tool. And I, I argued that it was a learning prosthesis. It's a tool, just like a physical prosthesis, a set of crutches, a cane, a boot, or what have you. They allow us to function um, despite physical limitations and achieve, despite those limitations, near full functionality to get around, et cetera. Models help us do that cognitively because the experiments are quite clear. We don't have uh, the cognitive biological complement to allow us to reason through the behavior of non-linear systems, systems whose whole is greater than the sum of its parts, without, without assistance, without these cognitive processes. So simulation is best equipped, is best thought of as a as a learning tool, a tool for learning uh, uh, more, um, more quickly, more reliably, more deeply more rigorously about the world uh, by providing us that extra assistance of a, of a computer. What does the computer do? It lets us not just you know, depict things nicely with pretty pictures, as important as that is, but it lets us see what the logical consequences are of that over time by running the model, by simulating it. Okay. So um, this morning, uh, we're going to be seeing some additional um, components of this vision of models as bringing people together, models as pooling knowledge, models as, um, as, as bringing to the surface different perspectives, models serving as boundary objects, and models as thinking tools. But yesterday had more than that. Um, and 
but specifically we started to engage with this particular tool, AnyLogic. And we, we saw that um, models are composed of interconnected pieces, pieces that, that just like the systems they mimic, um, uh, they, they deliver emergent behavior by virtue of their interconnections. And uh, when we build a model, we need to keep in mind uh, the purpose of the model, and that let serves as, as John Sturman says, a logical knife to cut away complexity that might otherwise be needed. And I agree that models are like maps. Um, they, uh, they're fit for purpose. Um, if we have a map to help us understand where electrical brownouts are occurring in the city, versus, uh, it's a very different map than one that helps us figure out where flooding is occurring in the city or why flooding is occurring in certain areas or how to best get around the subway system or how to best get around as a cyclist uh, versus in a vehicle. These are very different maps that we use. All of them are simplified depictions of the situation that, are, that have certain goals in mind. They, they have the goal in mind of informing certain types of behavior or decisions about certain types of behavior. Simulation models are like this as well. We have certain goals in mind of what we want, the questions we want to answer with the model. What are the purposes of the model? Is it to predict? Is it to allow us to assess the trade-off between interventions? Is it to improve our knowledge uh, about uh, um, how uh, a few processes might interact to explain the behavior that we see, the type of behavior we see in the world in different cases? Is it designed to bring people together predominantly? Is, is the model an operational tool to pool knowledge, to, to invite different perspectives to be brought to the surface? These are different purposes of a model, and, and uh, others yet seek to put value to, to, to collecting certain types of data to help us assess which data would be most valuable to additionally collect on a survey or, or help us, help us uh, interpret historical trends. Um, these are different purposes of models. When we built the models yesterday, um, we weren't emphasizing those so much but we were seeking to build up some simple skills. And we saw that models are composed of these pieces. And we, or we could build the model up by dragging in those pieces and then linking them up in different ways. So for example, we built up jointly the state charts uh, here for, um, for characterizing um, smoking status. We saw state charts specify a set of collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive states. But beyond the specifying the states, they specify the, the actions by which those states can change contingent on being in one state. You can, you can undertake actions as indicated by the arrows coming out of that state. So if I'm a never smoker, I can undergo initiation and become a current smoker, for example. Um, and we saw moreover that each of those actions is associated with a rule that governs under what conditions it fires. And we're starting to learn the vocabulary of some of these rules. There were two primary ones we saw yesterday uh, that, that we experimented, experimented with and we saw differences between them. Do you remember what those different rule types were. You don't have to remember the exact name, but give me the flavor of what they involved. Anyone remember? What sort of rule type was this? Hmm? Sorry? A rate. Yeah, it's, a, it's given by a hazard rate. Uh, probability per unit time. And there's timeout is the other one. Yes, that's right. And we talked about some of the mathematics of this, right? Um, and uh, somehow <laughs> the requisite diagrams disappeared overnight. Um, 
<laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, um, I, I recognize that uh, um, that that they well, what they lacked in artistic merit, they they made up for it <laughs> in, in utility to point to. So, um, yeah, um, yeah, but I won't fault you for for wanting to improve the aesthetics of the room. Um, so we saw two types of rules yesterday. We saw a timeout rule and we saw a rate rule. A timeout rule specifies you will leave at a certain specified time. The time could be constant or it could be actually drawn from a distribution. It's an interesting point, a non-negative distribution, right? You could draw it from a beta distribution or from a um, from an X. Well, you wouldn't draw it from an exponential because that would be a rate transition, but you could draw it from a, 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 a gamma distribution or an Erlang, or you could draw it from a, a truncated normal or what have you. Um, and we saw rate transitions when fixed, when, ha when they have fixed values, they're a memoryless transition. No matter how long you've been in the state, your chance of leaving in the next little bit is the same. If this is a fixed value. By contrast, if... Uh, if this were a, a time of transition, it's exactly memory full. Your chance of leaving in the next little bit depends entirely on how long you've been there. Those are two different types. But we thought we could build up these, these um, models through this. And we started with state charts. And we also learned about uh, variables. Do you remember what the role of a variable was compared to the role of a parameter? So we saw parameters here like population size does anyone remember what does a what does a parameter give you anyone a way of encoding assumption assumptions yeah and and i argued communicating those assumptions from the point of where this containing quantity is, is created this is a main main is created in a scenario. So the scenario is going to specify the value to be used for population size when main runs. By contrast, if a, if a parameter is specified within a person, the assumptions about that parameter are most commonly specified in the, in the population that contains the people. So when we built this model, we had a pop, we had agents. Uh, the person was kind of the cookie cutter template the template for agents to describe personhood, and then we had a population of these people. And if people had uh, parameters, the values of those parameters would have been specified by this uh, by this population. So, so. The job of parameters is to encode assumptions and communicate those assumptions from point of creation um, to the thing that's being created. By contrast, we also have variables. What's the job of a variable? The job of a variable is to fill in the blank. I said it yesterday, sorry? Vary. Vary, its job <laughs> is to vary. Its job is to change over time. Job is to capture, actually, to, to to capture the state of, a, of the value, um, and, but it it's changing over time generally. So things like a person's heart disease hazard rate here was changing over time as they change their what status? Their chance of developing heart disease per year was changing as they change their smoking, smoking status. Yeah. So it was higher when they were a smoker, their chance of dying of developing heart disease in the next year, I should say. It's higher when they were smokers than it was when they were um, uh, a, a former smoker or a, a never smoker. Um, and then there were some that were associated with kind of um, the visualization and, and, and boundary color and full color. And I argued that, that visualization for these models matters because it helps us understand the behavior of the model. A, model, a good model should invite critique so we can spot errors in it. We can spot problems. Um, maybe it's problems in the design of the model. Maybe it's problems in the implementation of the model. But a good model should make itself um, 
transparent in terms of uh, its behavior. And one way of doing that is to give visual appearances to uh, to quantities in the model as we run it, so we can we can see that behavior. And that's what we had yesterday. Today, we're going to be expanding on that to see um, uh, to see how we collect statistics from a model, how we how can I have output from the model that summarizes the model behavior, and how we can even keep track for a given individual of their history over time, their biography, as it were, of that particular person. Okay. Um, okay. Um, good. So uh, that was a bit of discussion of yesterday. Today, uh, we have a um, good set of material uh, in front of us. Statistics side, we're going to be talking about model purposes, and I'm going to talk a little bit about stylized versus empirically grounded models. And models that emphasize um, an endogenous perspective versus more exogenous perspective. This won't take that much time, but it's an important thing in understanding the diversity of models out there. And then I'm going to uh, further be uh, expanding on some of our repertoire within uh, agent-based modeling to look at networks and uh, linking agents up into networks by which they can interact with each other, uh, they perceive information across the networks, et cetera. Okay, so uh, that's for today. But also today, we, we're fortunate to have some guest lecturers, and the first will be Jenna talking about group model building and the use of these diagrams to draw insights, understanding, perspectives, different knowledge sets from people and, and interdisciplinary. Okay, so Jenna, would you like to come up and sure. Great, great, great. Are they in uh, what plat in what platform are they 